Hi everyone, how are you doing? This is Amanda. I do hope that you're well. I'm recording this in uh, July 2023, but actually I feel as though this is going to be the first of quite a few videos, probably in a series, and we're going to be going on quite a journey with a new guide that has come forward for me, but also for you. I'm going to explain who he is, who he was, why he's relevant now and in many ways it just feels such a perfect fit between him and me and our energy combined and also I suppose it's one of those things where I wasn't really even aware that I was looking for a guide like this. Uh, obviously I have other guides, particularly Archangel Metatron who you've heard me talk about many times, other Ascended Masters uh, but this particular guide, William T. Steed, is somebody who was alive during the Victorian age in Great Britain. He was a prominent journalist of his day. In fact, he's known as being, what is it, the most famous journalist in the whole British Empire of his day. But he was so much more than just a journalist. And summed up very neatly here um, by this little paragraph at the end of a book that I've been reading about him and also his own words. It says, Steed will be remembered as a crusader, an outspoken supporter of many movements, popular and unpopular, an advocate of world peace and women's rights, a defender of civil liberties and a fighter for the deprived and the oppressed correspondence reveals that he was always guided by a moral mission and influenced by his faith and saw his position as a journalist as, quote, a glorious opportunity to attack the devil. Uh, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about who he was, but I'd also like to share some of my experiences that, that I've had over the last couple of months, particularly the last two weeks. And I feel as though not only can he do something for me, he can do something for you. Since tapping into his energy again recently, my powers of telepathy, for example, have expanded hugely. I've also been granted the gift, which probably was always there, but had laid dormant of automatic writing. Now, that's a little bit different from you know, writing and channeling spirit. I mean, it is that. But I suppose what William is teaching me is the discipline of doing it and allowing somebody like him to come through and effectively use my hand, but also use my voice to document thoughts in terms of where we are now in our world what he was all about all those years ago, and of course he was somebody that died on Titanic, which is what first brought him to my attention. And I did channel him three years ago uh, briefly in a video which also included, it was a real mixture. We also looked, it was right at the start of the pandemic. We also channeled the Chinese doctor that um, was one of the whistleblowers, didn't make it unfortunately, but he came through. Um, also, Leonard Nimroy came through, Dr. Spock from Star Trek. And then we also had uh, two people from Titanic that came through, one of which was William T. Steed. I, at the time, thought, yeah, I probably need to go back to this guy and, you know, channel a bit more. Never got round to it. His photograph that I had printed out, which it looks like this, and you might remember from uh, me showing it last time, sorry, that's my light, um, sat on my desk for the next three years until a couple of weeks ago. And I thought, I had a big clear out and I thought, I'm just going to get rid of this. I don't think I'm going to be channeling him again. And then bingo, as soon as I tore up the photograph, he came in big time. <laughs> so, and I'll tell you a little bit about photography as well, because there's a story with that as well. But anyway, this is what he looked like. Um, I went away on holiday, as you know, l last week. Feels like ages ago, but it was only last week. And I was reading this book, The Blue Island. 
um, and other spiritual writings by William T. Steed and Estelle Steed. Um, and it's particularly the first part of the book, a, a, a little short book within a longer book, The Blue Island, that I'm going to be referencing in this video. I went through it. It's basically about the afterlife. It's about what he found after he transitioned. And it's almost like he was reporting back as the journalist that he was on Earth in terms of what he'd found when he passed over to help us understand what, uh, what, what occurs with us when we do the same. Of course, I believe we've passed over many times in many different lifetimes. But the thing about when you come back to an incarnation is you tend to forget that experience. And lots of people can be very frightened of death without realising it is just literally walking through another door. But the question is, what is on the other side of the door? And William T. Steed talks about it being this blue realm, this blue land, which is literally just one staging post. It's the first place that we go to for healing after we die. And then after that, there are other lands, as he calls it, realms, dimensions, you might wish to refer to it as, um, that follow. So I think in this video, which is going to be an introduction, I'm going to go through some of the most salient points that I found with regards to what he was saying about this blue land, the blue island, as he calls it. Uh, I'm also going to share with you a couple of pieces of automatic writing that I've done. They're quite short um, so far with him, uh, just to, I suppose, illustrate uh, the power of his voice. He was in life a very articulate man. He still is very articulate as spirit. And he, I think, has been searching for somebody to work with for a while on planet Earth, as it were. For whatever reason, it feels as though he's chosen me to do that work with him going forward. And I feel very blessed at this whole encounter. It's very unexpected. Wasn't wasn't expecting it at all, to be perfectly honest. Uh, as I said, I ripped up his photograph two weeks ago. Uh, but now I'm realising this is the start of a whole new journey of work to come through. Probably will turn into a book as well with regard to the automatic writings. But to give you a flavour of why he's relevant now, over and above what may have happened on Titanic, I would like you to understand what he was about all those years ago. Because what you'll realise is what he was interested in all those years ago and what he was campaigning for all those years ago is pretty much exactly where we are now. OK, so here we have a guide coming back to help us at a time when we really need it. You know, we're, we're in an age where we are seeing the collapse of um, old traditional forms of media. And I think it's true to say, and this is this is not any observation whether I think it's good, bad or whatever, but a lot of younger people get all of their information with regards to what's going on in the news from platforms such as TikTok, other, other social media channels. The days of maybe sitting down with a broadsheet newspaper um, or reading in depth isn't what a lot of people are doing anymore. Having said that, there will always be a place for in-depth journalism. But we know the whole realm of journalism and the people that maybe operate at the top of it is problematic at this moment in time. That's putting it very mildly, isn't it? So here we have William T. Steed coming back, speaking through me, um, he was regarded as, this is a quote, the most famous journalist in the whole British Empire when he was alive. He is also regarded as being the pioneer of investigative journalism. Um, this is a big claim, but this is just in the, the biography that I've read of his, um, that he was one of the first journalists to pioneer the introduction of the interview technique. Um, with regards to journalism as well. We're living in an age now where everybody's interviewed about everything. Um, but this is also really interesting with regard to the journalism uh, side of who he was. I'm just going to read from, from this book here because he's said to have also been the originator of the modern journalistic technique of creating a news event 
rather than just reporting it. Now, hold on a moment. We know right now that sometimes, uh, choose my words carefully because of the platform that I'm on, there are certain news events that are not always what they appear to be, that we can be manipulated, we can be shown something that isn't necessarily real or is certainly a distorted version of the actual truth. Uh, more and more of this will be revealed in the future, we know that. Now, it's not saying that that's what he was about, but what he started has become perverted, okay? So it's like anything that can be used for good can also be corrupted by other people who take something worthwhile and turn it sour. So what he did was he tried to not just report, but to create a news event to get it into the news for the best reasons. And it was actually a case which was linked into white slavery, white slave traffic. And I'm just going to read this book, so, uh, this bit. It says, so after publishing a series of articles entitled The Maiden Tribute of Modern Babylon to demonstrate the truth of his findings. So he was trying to expose the white slave trade, basically. Uh, nobody was listening. Nobody was really reading it. What he did was he arranged the purchase in commas because he didn't really want to purchase. It was for the sake of showing that this was really going on. He arranged the purchase of Eliza Armstrong, who was the daughter of a chimney sweep. He successfully proved that the trade actually existed. Um, he was sent to prison for three months um, and that was a conviction just based on a technicality that he hadn't at first secured the permission of the girl's father. He obviously wasn't interested in the girl. He was just trying to prove that the slave trade was real. And I believe I read somewhere that um, after he was released from prison, he every year on the anniversary of when he became imprisoned, he he would dress up in the regalia of the of the of the prison garb to make his point, basically, <laughs> to remind people of what he did, because he was actually proud of what he did, because he was trying to show that the slave trade was real. There's also another thing that he was, one of the things he's also known for is the Steed Act. Now, this is obviously linked into the UK, but again, very pivotal act. He was the person who um, helped increase the age of consent in this country from 13 to 16, um, which is still law to this day. So it became known as the Steed Act. So he was a champion of children's rights, basically. Um, let me just read this as well. So I'm just trying to paint a picture of who he was and what he cared about. And I think you will start to realize that this is all stuff that is so topical now. Uh, you know, child trafficking, for example, the case that I've just said here. And this is another one. So um, one of the first editorials on a new paper that he was writing for was on the issue of prostitution. Um, he, in his words, he wrote, it was the ghastliest curse which haunts civilised society which is steadily sapping the very foundations of our morality. Yet it was not the prostitute herself that offended Steed's austere morality, since destitute women often had little choice but to turn to prostitution or face life in the dreaded workhouse. His criticism was aimed at a much higher echelon of society. Quote, stylish houses of ill fame, he thundered, could only be supported by men of wealth and respectability. It was their reckless passion to which the ruin of the poor unfortunate is due. And it says he was playing with fire. Prostitution was not a suitable topic for daily journalism. The subject was taboo in the press. His whole life was lived like that. And there's another great quote here from him, which is from a website called attackingthedevil.co.uk. 
um, all about W.T. Steed, and I'll link it below. But the quote says, society, this is his quote, society, outwardly indeed, appears white and glistening, but within is full of dead men's bones and rottenness. So those are just two of the subjects that he sort of took on. So uh, slavery, trafficking, prostitution. Um, here is a man who was in journalism for the right reasons. He also tried to make it, um, uh, take it away from journalism now, writing, literature, tried to bring that to the masses as well. And I really passionately believe that this is important now. I feel that we're in a time whereby it's becoming, uh, society is becoming uh, lesser through not investing in great works and culture and art and literature and things that basically challenge us, stimulate our mind, um, inf invoke our heart centre, um, make us think. It's as though it's becoming dumbed down. So again, you know, going back to the Victorian age, what he tried to do was he brought classic. Remember, this is way before, you know, the Internet or, you know, bookshops or online things or anything like that. The, we, we, we have so much accessible to us these days, but so often we're choosing something. We're choosing a meal that is junk, which is not feeding our soul in any way. He was all about feeding the soul. So what he tried to do was he, he brought out abridged reprints of classic literature under titles such as Penny Poets and Penny Popular Novels. It's very much about trying to feed the soul of a nation. And I feel as though he's coming back to help feed our souls, to help heighten our powers of intuition and telepathy, and he was, I haven't even got on to his work at the moment about, he was a great spiritualist of his day. Um, so there's that as well. Let's talk about that next, actually. So, you know, we have to remember the Victorian era was very interested in all things mystic, psychic, um, etc. So it wasn't that unusual, but he was definitely one of the more unusual and prominent followers of it. Um, he was very big on automatic writing and that's one thing I'm learning from him, the importance of that. In fact, on holiday, when I was reading this book and I was in holiday mode, you know, I was in holiday mode. I was sitting in a deck chair, the sun was shining, I had a glass of wine. It was all very nice. Just, you know, making notes of what I thought was important. And I thought, I wonder if this is just a holiday thing. It's just, you know, I thought, is, am I meant to work with you? Because I really felt I was, but equally it could just have been a book on holiday. So I, I said, OK, is there a message for me personally? Am I meant to be working with you? And I can't remember where it is, but I opened it at a page where he actually talks about um, the need. He, he's, it's a request. He's asking you to sit down every day at the same hour and to allow him to, to use your hand to write. And I think he said something along the lines of spiritualism isn't just a holiday pastime. <laughs> and of course, I don't view it as that, but it was so spot on. And I knew at that moment that I was meant to be working with him. Uh, but yeah, a great spiritualist and has written a number of books. This one I will link below. So anything else I want to say about him before I get to the Blue Island, the, the realm, and then I'm also going to do a bit of channeling with him where I ask him questions with regards to what I was unclear of, with regards to what he was showing us about what happens after we die. Um, I, I will say as well, obviously, he's most known for having died on Titanic. Um, he was actually due to attend a peace conference in Carnegie Hall in New York, invited by the then president of the USA. Uh, I, I believe he, he had also been nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize for other works of peace during his age. But yeah, that's where he was. He was en route to this peace conference in New York when he died on the ship. Um, it, this is a beautiful part from the book here. It said that Steed, somebody who survived Titanic, basically, their memories of 
they, they, they remembered seeing him on the boat as it went down. And they remembered him helping several women and children into the lifeboats in an act typical of his generosity, courage and humanity. You see, that is the sign of a good soul, isn't it? Somebody who, as I'm always saying, walks the talk. He's talking and he's working towards helping uh, to eradicate, for example, child slavery, standing up for the poor, standing up for women. And at the moment that the boat is going down and he knows he's probably going to die, he's helping to save the women and children. This is a special soul. It's a very advanced, enlightened soul, which is why I'm so excited about him coming forward to speak with us. So this man that survived Titanic um, said of him that, yeah, he'd seen him saving the women and children. But he then also saw Steed clinging to a raft with a fellow passenger uh, their feet became frozen and they were compelled to release their hold. Both were drowned. His body was never recovered. It reminds me of that scene from the end of Titanic, you know, when Rose and uh, Leonardo, whatever he was called, um, Jack, isn't it? Jack and Rose, are, you know, he has to let her go. She just gets, she, she, you know, he gets frozen. So I've just got that scene in my mind now. But the other interesting thing, so many interesting things uh, about him is that also he was said to have prophesied, basically, that the Titanic would go down. He didn't obviously realise that was the boat as he got onto it that was going to go down. But it's reported that he published two articles, um, one in 1886, which was years before Titanic you know, sailed, um, which was the, the article was titled How the Mail Steamer Went Down in Mid Atlantic by a Survivor. Uh, and it was the story of a steamer that collided with another ship with a high loss of life due to the lack of lifeboats. And Steed added, This is exactly what might take place and will take place if liners are sent to sea short of boats. And then the second story was called From the Old World to the New. Um, again, before Titanic, and this vessel, Majestic, rescues survivors of another ship that collided with an iceberg. So it's almost as though he wrote about what what was to occur without realising that that was what was happening. So, <clears throat> yeah, just a really, really interesting man. So we're going to get now to the Blue Island. Oh, I think before I do that, actually, if I may, I'm just going to read you two very short pieces of automatic writing that have already come through me. Uh, I believe it's him talking. Uh, to be honest, I literally it's less than a couple of minutes worth uh, because I didn't have a lot of time. But I'm learning that I will find time for him every day to write. Uh, that's my promise to you, William. So the first one was on holiday. I wrote this and it's just about channeling. So what he's saying is he says, channeling is an art, a lost art, one which one, one which when done correctly under the right circumstances and with the right intent can be a force of good in this world and the next. A line of communication which can ease misunderstanding soothe the suffering of those bereaved or just departed to adjust, acclimatise and make sense of where they are now. Done not for gain, but for an expansion of consciousness to aid the ever evolving creative process and onward spiral ever upward of life. So that was the first one that came through. This one came through this morning, about half an hour ago. So I just wrote this. Uh, I said, so it's message for the collective, what you need to know now, William T. Steed. This is what he said. These are unprecedented times which require un unprecedented action, energy and drive to fulfil all that you came to be. Time is short upon this earth, but yet mankind behaves as though it has all the time in the world. Not true whilst here. You should savour every last drop, devour every experience, good and bad. Not get so easily fatigued by that which serves to weaken, lower and distract you. 
you will want to write and sorry you will want to read a whole book a whole lifetime to review your story once here not in the hours and days but in the adventures that you can only have whilst on earth in a body a physical body a physical vehicle that takes you wherever you choose to take it will you choose the couch or the rocking chair or a passport to unlocking and unraveling mysteries via seeing doing interacting and getting out there get out there live as though this was your last day on earth and choose wisely that which is fortuitous and prosperous to body mind and soul make every minute count for you never know the hour so live all 60 minutes of each one left he's not saying the world's about to end he's not saying you're about to die but he is bringing into focus the fact that we never know the hour and so we should always live our best life so yes that was this morning which which came through from him uh, the other thing that happened on the holiday whilst i was reading the blue island which is all about the power of uh, the color blue and i'll tell you about that in a moment is hold on let me just close the window no i can't do anything about that noise apologies somebody's making a noise outside the window um the color blue followed me through the holiday and uh, i kept i was in chateaus for example walking around these beautiful old stately buildings and i kept capturing blue orbs in many of the photographs i did put them up on my facebook page and my instagram page if you're not there you can have a look at some of them but one in particular i'm just trying to find it was taken of me in uh, a in a chateau and there is a blue oh, there, there we go Let's see if i can just don't know whether you can see that on the photograph can you see the blue light either side of me a few things about this photograph so reading about the blue realm uh brings it closer as a as a medium as somebody who's able to uh visit both sides of the veil as it were it it's almost like a proof that i'd brought some of that blue energy with me from what i'd been reading about um but blue is also a color of great peace it's a color of great mental peace um and i felt such peace when i was actually standing there at that particular moment so the photograph really shows that as well okay let's get to the writings then and as i say you can read it for yourself but these are just some of the most pertinent points that i brought out of it okay one thing i thought was fascinating was he doesn't go into great depth about the moment that he died on titanic but we he he takes us to a place where it's obvious that all of the souls that died on titanic um moved together as one one great big homogenous group to the blue island the blue realm and although time as we understand it here on earth doesn't exist in the blue realm or the other side of the veil he still got a sense of the passage of it although he wouldn't call it time he was aware that he had passed and there was a great comfort and in in knowing that he didn't say it from an egotistical point of view but that he got it right that he didn't die and pass over and everything was a shock and not as he expected it to be it it confirmed a lot of what he had felt it would be like when he was on earth but not everybody passes with that same level of comfort doesn't mean it has to be um unpleasant it just means that if you're somebody that's never thought about spiritual matters what happens to you after you die um you know it can be a bit of a shock you don't he, he talks about the fact that people um who who die sometimes the souls take a while to actually realize that they are dead 
because they don't appreciate that they are because it actually feels very similar to being alive because you are still alive. It's just you've dropped the body. You, you've dropped the body, but you haven't, you're still a living soul with the same personality. He talks about personality a lot, personality of the soul that you had um, on earth. Obviously, that personality gets shaped by other incarnations, although that's me saying that because he hasn't talked yet to me about other incarnations. That's a piece of work I will do with him. But uh, definitely there seems to be different levels in terms of uh, awareness and knowledge when people pass. And some people are just like, yeah, this is, this is great. This is what I probably thought it would be like. It still feels... Um, yeah. I'm still me, you know, I still have my personality and my soul and my spirit. That is who I am. And others are just like, I don't even realise that I've died. So anyway, there was this period where the people on Titanic, and obviously some people died quickly, some people didn't, died a bit more slowly. There was a waiting period. And then when they had all gathered, uh, they all passed as one to this blue island, um, blue blue realm. And... One question I have for him, which I, I'll talk, I'll do the questions at the end. But one question is he talks about traveling to this blue island and indeed traveling to other realms and dimensions. He, 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 he refers to it a bit like flying. It's as though it feels a bit like flying through the air. It reminded me a bit like Peter Pan type energy. It's like flying through the air and then you land somewhere. Um, but very fast. Uh, but, but I want to talk to him about that. But anyway, you, 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 you land, you're in the Blue Island. And then as a colour therapist, I was really intrigued by this awareness of colour. Uh, why blue? Why is it blue? Well, as, she, as I'm waving a blue pen at you, uh, <laughs> as I was doing that, why blue? Uh, blue, it's soothing. It's soothing to the brain. It's soothing to the mind. It's soothing to the soul, but particularly the mind. Um, so it's a place of healing. And that blue energy is absolutely paramount for that. Um, it's a place where you make peace with your passing. It's a place where you make peace with letting go of your earthly attachments and earthly attachments, the big one, of course, is the physical body, getting used to not having the physical body. Um, he talks about in this book as well, and um, you've heard many people probably say this, that when you pass, your soul leaves, your soul, your spirit leaves the body. And then it's as though you look down on the body. And it's as though, yes, you're sort of looking at an old friend, but it's not you. It's a very odd thing. People who've had out-of-body experiences sometimes uh, can get that as well. In fact, I will tell you one strange dream I had two nights ago that feels as though it's linked to this work. Uh, it wasn't William T. Steed. It was actually, I don't want to say the person's name. It's a male spiritual teacher, very prominent. I like him a lot. So that will narrow it down because I've usually told you the type of people I follow. Uh, he's an influencer, he's a spiritual teacher, he's huge, he's big. Anyway, for some reason, I saw him meditating. This guy does yoga. He was meditating. He was in such a deep, meditative, yogic position that he was totally zoned out. And I saw his consciousness. It was as though it started to move out of his body from his crown. So he was lying in my dream. I don't know why I was seeing it, but I, I could see him. He was just zoned out. He was meditating. He wasn't on drugs or anything like that. It was a natural process. He'd got himself into a very deep meditative process where he had become slightly disassociated from the body because he, he had remembered that he was just pure spirit. And then it's as though I saw the spirit leaving the body um, he, he hasn't died, okay, and he's not about to die. It was, I think, just for me to witness. What was so interesting about it was that the spirit moving out of his crown looked a bit like a, well, it, it was gold, actually. It was like a goldy yellow colour, a bit like a, a, 
jelly is not quite the right word to put it. It was flat. It was a flat sphere. Um, it was translucent. It, it wasn't a material that I recognise. It wasn't jelly, but it wasn't solid. It was spirit and it just moved out. And then I, I, I sort of said to him in my dream, hold on, you, you, don't, don't detach completely. Don't detach completely. And I was aware that it then started to shift back into him a little bit. So that was really interesting. I just had to share that with you because it's really stayed with me. It also felt as though it was like an operating system that was, you know, like a, in the old days with computers, you had a floppy disk and you put the floppy disk into the drive and your computer word up and started. This was like that. It was like an operating system. It was like a disk, but it was natural. It was organic. It was spirit. It was him. It was his energy. But it was like, don't get too far out of your body so you can't get back into it. That's what I really was trying to say to him. And then I woke up and he's still alive and well now, so I'm sure he's fine. <laughs> but uh, there's something in that linked into this stuff as well, because what William is saying is that, of course, when the spirit completely leaves the body, you're dead. But you often don't realise you are. Some of the people that maybe are less evolved for want of a better word have never thought about these things it's like they don't realize they are because they're still they can still see the room they can still see the people um yet for him he realized very quickly and as i say they all went as one to this blue realm which was this place where you make peace with you've let your body go but equally the process of discarding earthliness is a gradual one and i found this really interesting because it's to do with losing interest in earthly stuff um and he used the example of things such as food uh sleep uh the our necessities here on earth and indeed we might love I mean I love food personally and I love sleep as well but of course you don't need that when you're spirit but this resting place this blue island is a beautiful land because if you want it you can still have it but you're not going to stay there forever it's a transient place by nature it's a transient place it's not a permanent resting place also very very um uh aware uh, and something that i've always felt this this phrase rest in peace is a misnomer spirit doesn't just lie there and never never do anything in some grand mausoleum when we say rest in peace it's really linked into this blue island phase this is me talking now this is my intuition it's this blue island phase. It's like you're meant to rest for a while. You're meant to recover. You're meant to review. You're meant to process. You're meant to catch your breath. You're meant to let go of the earthly things. But then you move on. You move on to other lands. And there, there is work to do. But that word work isn't really the right word either. But there's just life to do, is what William is saying to me. There is life to do. There are things to attend to whether you are a spirit guide that helps others, whether you're working uh, up there, as it were, in other capacities to help this earth, to help other lands, other galaxies, uh, to refine yourself and your own evolution. The whole process of spiritual enlightenment is an ever, ever evolving one. And this is one of the things at the moment in the spiritual community. It's like ascension and awakening and the wave and suddenly we've got it. We've only got a tiny, tiny percentage of it. And we, we never will get all of it when we're here. It would be impossible to get it all when we're here, to be completely awakened whilst we're here. It's, he, he's saying to me, it's like even Jesus keeps evolving. And I know some people will be triggered by that. But he's wanting to try and make you see that even the ascended masters are constantly evolving. I have said that actually over the years. Metatron told me that years ago that he's evolving as we are evolving because he is of God. Anything that is of God is always evolving and everything is of God. So fascinating, really. But yeah, this thing about losing interest in earthly stuff. Also, for me as a medium, I found it very interesting because many of the people I've channeled, particularly Heart Squad, um, that's right, because he was talking about clothes. You can have clothes up there. And it's like, clothes? What are you going on about? You haven't got a body. Bear with me on this. It's an earthly attachment. If the soul is feeling discombobulated, doesn't quite understand, you know, 
um, what has happened, why the earthly life has ended as it has, um, still needs to heal. It can have anything that brings it comfort, be that food, be that um, clothes, be that sleep, anything that on earth gave pleasure. If you're a great cricketer, okay, and you've loved to play cricket, you can have your cricket bat, okay, you can play cricket. Um, but it's not like you're always going to be doing that because the blue realm is only a transient place. You will go on. You'll leave your cricket back behind. You'll leave your clothes behind. You don't need your clothes. OK, it's like God is tolerant. God is patient. God will give you what you need. It's like a comfort blanket. Imagine the baby or the child. If you're a parent, you give the child what brings it comfort. It doesn't need the teddy. It doesn't need the comfort necessarily, but it but it sort of does. So you provide that until the child no longer needs it. And going back to Heart Squad, you see, it's always been fascinating to me. It's like Prince always brings his guitar. Um, but that's not to say that Prince is stuck in the blue realm. The blue realm is somewhere that you go initially. It's like a, it's also, it's, it's what I called the bridge and the meeting spot in the bridge in my earlier channelings, I always referred to the fact we were meeting over the Rainbow Bridge and we were meeting at the at the, at the top of it, the crux of it. And spirit would come and we would go there and we would, we would sit on the bench. Do you remember those channelings that I did? The bench is the blue planet. OK, the bench is that meeting point. So spirit can also come um, back at any time to this blue, the blue island. So I keep calling it the blue planet, the blue island. Um, to communicate with us. And when they do, imagine, so yeah, let's use Prince as a good, ex as a good example because he's a very highly evolved soul and he's not just there on the blue island. He's definitely left behind his earthly attachments, including to sex. That's another one that, you know, the sexual thing that many people are very addicted to in this life, not saying he was addicted to it, but he was a very sexual being. You don't really need that, you know, when you're spirit. So, um, Prince did his life review, he did his healing, whatever he needed to let go of, he did. And he's off, off and away. You know, he's far away, or doing all sorts of magical things in different realms, learning, evolving. But when he comes back, either because he wants to, OK, to see what we're all up to or to help. Maybe his city is in need and he comes back and he tries to help. Or maybe there's a subject that was very close to his heart and we're struggling with it. So he comes back to help. Um, why would he not pick up his old discarded guitar that's there on the Blue Island for him? Wouldn't you? I would. Or if you're the great cricketer, wouldn't you pick up your bat? And so as a medium, you see these things and it's like he's, he's wearing his frilly shirt. I've often said that to you, haven't I? When I've channeled spirit, it's like I always tell you what they're wearing. And I've always been a bit like, that's odd, really, because I'm seeing Elvis and he has got his rhinestone suit on. And Diana has got the big ruffly neck neck shirt that she always used to love wearing, all the um, sports gear or whatever it was. But it's because they're just picking up. It's like old favourites. The analogy I'm being given here by spirit is when you leave home, and I'm talking about, you know, your parental home, often your parents will still maintain your bedroom for you. So it will still have all your things in it, your posters on the wall, you know, some clothes in the wardrobe, whatever. And even if you're 45, you go back and you can't wait to have a look through the old boxes that dear old mum and dad are still keeping, you, you know, because it brings comfort. There's nothing wrong with that. And there's a lot, there's a remembrance of the love for earth. Um, but also what I've observed over the years with my channeling is the fact that when a, if, if a soul has had a very traumatic time on earth, uh, coming back can cause a degree of pain, um, not physical pain, but it's like a, it's like a remembrance. It's a memory that comes back. And so, you know, we, we shouldn't be too selfish when we call on spirit the whole time for our needs. Um, they will come, but sometimes it can be at a cost. There have been a few that I've noticed that of, that it's as though their energy is, um, that they're more pained when they, Michael Jackson would be a classic one. It, 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 he always feels a little bit, it's just like it all comes back, everything that was done to him and said of him. And it's like, it's still being said about him, etc. And I don't believe it's true. He's never, he's, you know, etc. So 
it's like there's a sadness there, but he still does it because he loves humanity. So the blue, the blue realm, this sort of, it's like a waiting room. It's like a beautiful waiting room. Um, right. Another thing I took from what William is William T. Steed is saying in this book is this is guidance here for mediums, people that channel spirit like me. This made a lot of sense to me. He says the spirit that's trying to get in touch has much has as much to do with the success or the failure of the connection. It's not just about the medium skill. Now, of course, there is a skill. There is a art to channeling, as William said through me earlier. But equally, it's a two way street. I've always felt this. So sometimes when you don't get the connection or you get maybe a wrong piece of advice or it's distorted in some way or you bring something through and it's like, well, that's not quite right. Sometimes it can be you as a medium. Absolutely. It can be your fault or your uh, there's all sorts of things you need to do to prepare to bring messages through from spirit. But it can also be down to the spirit itself. So I thought that was really interesting. The spirit itself has, has as much to do with the success or the failure of the connection. And he gives a really good example of this. One of the things that the Victorians were very interested in was trying to capture um, photographs of spirit. OK, so that often they sat in seance and this type of thing, um, but trying to capture a photograph of spirit. Now, in, in the age that we live in, I showed you that picture of myself. I have captured spirit in that photograph. OK, whether it's William himself whether it is an angelic presence, whether it's my higher self, whatever it is, I've captured spirit in that photograph. We're used to seeing orbs in photographs, uh, aren't we? Um, and, and seeing that. But in the Victorian age, they were more interested in, I want to see the face, I want to see the person. And of course, they didn't have, you know, iPhones or Instamatic cameras or Polaroid cameras or if you're as old as me, the cameras which used to have the film in that you had to send to the shop. And then two weeks later, you got your photographs back with the negatives, all of that. None of that. You know, it was the old Victorian first um, experiences of photography with the great big metal plates that went into the box and the flash gun went off and they all look a bit startled. But anyway, um, one of the things that William T. Steed wanted to do after he died was he wanted to show himself as spirit in a photograph. And um, this this picture here is of him. I think this is his daughter um, who sat, uh, whether it was in seance or uh, mediumship circles, very popular, as I say, during the Victorian age. And somebody tried to capture him. So they took a photograph of her um, but it was as though there was a date set. So she knew that the father was present in spirit and wanted to capture the photograph of them both together. So she's alive, he's dead, but there he is. It is his face. But what he says in the book, in, in this book, it's so interesting is that the mistake I made is that you can only see my face. And he said that was because I was focusing on my face, not my whole physicality. Uh, remember, spirit will show you how they ex think you want to see them. So, yes, he's left the physical body, but this is like a um, evidence that he's still real. Because if it was just a, a blurry, you know, wisp of smoke, nobody would know it was him or anybody else. So but he said the mistake I made was I was just focusing on trying to get my face into the photograph or what my face used to look like into the photograph that I forgot I had a body. <laughs> so in many ways, it's showing both, isn't it? It's showing the fact that spirit is has no body, but equally that spirit can manifest how you want it to look. And that's true for all spirit. It's true of the angels as well. They can take on any form that... Um, you wish them to but usually they will appear to you in the way that you expect to see them so if you expect to see the angel and it has to have wings the angel will appear with wings on its back if you expect to see it in a different way you'll see it in a different way so yeah that's a good little story that so I love that yeah the spirit itself has as much to do with the success or the failure of the connection and he in spirit was really cross because the first few times when they tried to photograph him in spirit it didn't work 
but he realized it was it was it was his fault in many ways it wasn't the photographer's fault and this gets us into a whole other realm of his teaching which is to do with the power of the mind because um he talks a lot about the fact that we need to be mastering our mind on earth because the mind and this reminded me very much of tesla um tesla's work which is that everything starts from a thought everything starts from a thought everything in our everyday life everything that you have around you everything that's in your life has started from a thought that you have that has then become manifested so the importance of being in control of our minds and not allowing our minds to just go anywhere you know and go awry um and in spirit it's the same it's 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 as though well mind and spirit and soul are sort of the same thing in his in in his language he talks about them in in th in a different way so i realize here on earth other psychologists and great thinkers separate spirit soul and mind um but he sorry he he regards soul as as being mind spirit as being self body as being physical so i know i'm going through these things really quickly but believe it or not this is just an introduction i'm just trying to get you as interested in this as i am because i'm going to be devoting some time to this guy and want to get to a place where i'm bringing messages through from him but for you to understand who he is is going to give much more power to those messages so yeah power of the mind um his what he's basically saying is that he manifested this image in the spirit photograph through the power of his mind as spirit he willed himself there he willed himself there he willed it to manifest so the success of the exercise was as much to do with him as it was to do with others the other interesting thing about it was he was saying that um the first he realized that there were certain times when it wouldn't have been able to have happened because straight after he passed he of course was upset at leaving behind his family um his friends so to have seen them at that time would there would have been too much emotion and emotion too much emotion can be the enemy of a focused mind as well so what can he help us with many things he can help us and he can bring messages through about the big subjects of our day particularly as i say we're going to be seeing the collapse of media we're going to be seeing the creation of a new form of journalism and media and i feel as though as he was in the victorian age so he is now he's going to be helping with that the whole um, un, you know uncomfortable difficult conversations around uh, child sex trafficking which are here now whether we like it or not he was talking about it decades ago he's going to help us with that um he's going to help us to understand how important it is to be focused and that the mind is a great creator and that we can create destruction with it and our own uh demise effectively or we can use it to elevate our consciousness and that what we create here on earth and the state of our mind when we at uh, the state of our mind uh travels with us to the blue island so everything can be healed everything can be soothed but it's as though there's a much more straightforward passage um if we can do do the work here before we get there okay because ultimately the destination is somewhere else anyway the blue island is just this place of um rest it's it's not a permanent place okay so i think i'll end this video by asking him a few questions before i do that actually i'm just reading my notes so the last last thing here about everything starts from a mental thought you need to master your mind he's really about mind mastery i'm being shown a game of chess now he's shown me a game of chess and uh, sorry that's my stomach rumbling i'm hungry uh hungry for knowledge is what he's saying the human race is hungry for knowledge people aren't even aware that they are 
eating a bad diet, the diet is what people are ingesting, what they are doing with their time, what they're reading, what they're watching, um, all of that, okay? So in terms of the mind, mastering your mental thoughts, he breaks our thoughts down into those that are meaningless, okay, that have no impact on you after you die. You know, they're not, you don't have to necessarily account for the fact that you woke up today, you looked in the mirror, you thought, oh, my hair looks good, my hair doesn't look good. Um, what shall I have for dinner? Uh, shall I watch something on the TV? Tonight? It's all meaningless. It's all meaningless stuff. by meaningless I really mean that it's not it doesn't last it's just you know it's just it's just stuff that comes in goes out yeah so meaningless meaningless thoughts okay then there are the two big thoughts they can either be constructive or they can be destructive now actually he's, he also says meaningless thoughts can become destructive thoughts if they dominate you. So if all you ever think about is like, oh my God, what does my hair look like? You know, is my lipstick all right? All of this type of stuff. Then that becomes destructive. I was actually watching a programme last night on Dubai and uh, the building of all of that um, extraordinary extravagance and the money and the gold. And they were interviewing some woman. I think she's an influencer, the top influencer there. And she's all about the lips and the boobs and the hair and the and her whole life is just about that from what I could make out. And I was just looking at it thinking, please don't try not to judge Amanda. Try not to judge. But I was failing a bit because it was just to me it felt so shallow. It was just like it was all is that all you're interested in? You see, that would be to me would be a good example of what William's saying, which is like a lot of those thoughts that this woman has got are just meaningless, really. But they've become destructive because that's all that they are. That's all the thoughts that are there. Because they're meaningless, they've become destructive. They're destructive because they're blocking you from a more elevated, evolved consciousness that wants to speak through you, talk through you, move through you, expand all of that. The great big world out there. But if you're just, you know, you can't see past the gold and the lipstick and the plastic it's like that is a block it's a big block anyhow yeah so thoughts are constructive they are destructive or destructive and you know what you're wanting to do is to be building the constructive thoughts that are going to help you not just in this life but in the next life to come as well so I think at this point I'm just going to change my battery because it looks like it's about to give out on me. And then I'm going to ask William a question with regards to this travelling to other lands. He describes it as a sensation that's flying through air. Um, and one other question, which I don't know what it is yet. Uh, one phrase that he has all the way through this, this um, book is, as you are, so you will be. As you are, so you will be. What that basically means is the Blue Island, where you land after you die. Uh, as you are, so you will be. Okay, it's a bit like you reap what you sow. You reap what you sow. He does talk a little bit about hell as well. Um, but I need to revisit what it is he actually said about that. Maybe that's the second question. I'm just going to change my battery and then I will be back. Thank you. I'm realising that this video is nearly an hour long already, so I actually am not going to go on for too much longer. Um, having paused the camera, it's really quite interesting. You might or might not have been able to hear a bit of banging noise, which is coming from the neighbour here. And this is so symbolic, I think I just have to tell you. I just thought, what, what is that noise? I've just gone and looked out the window at the back. Um, there's a lady, so it's female, she's ripping down a fence with her bare hands, literally like with her bare hands pulling down a wooden fence. Do you not think that's symbolic on the day that I'm doing a channeling all about us trying, <laughs> that's the wood being thrown onto the garden. On the day that I'm doing a video about trying to, what this is what he's about. This is what William T. Steed is offering us. He's wanting to help break down the barriers 
between this life and the next um, to help us be able to hear each other on both sides of the veil, the fence, the veil. <laughs> blown away, just blown away by that. So anyway, I'm just going to tune into his energy now. And in fact, this is one thing he'd like me to do with you. Okay. So what happened earlier was the photograph that I threw away of him that looked like that. Okay. I thought, right, I need to go and print it out again. So I went to my printer today and tried to print it out and my printer is broken. It reminded me very much of the attempts of his of his to come through in spirit photograph like technology was the barrier and i realized straight away what he wanted he wanted i'm showing you okay this photograph but he almost like it's like he's saying forget the technology forget the printer forget that mode because the future the way that we're going to hear each other see each other is telepathy so over and above what he looks like there can we just spend a moment together just tuning into his energy? And I'm going to ask him to appear to us in... I'm just going to ask him to appear to us uh, without putting any conditions in terms of what that looks like, uh, what he may say. I would just like to give him the stage. So I'm being shown a stage. It has a spotlight it's like a theatre hall. It has a spotlight. There is nobody in the spotlight at the moment. He is to the side of the stage and he is going to walk out onto the stage. Now, I have to say I am seeing him in a particular... Um, I'm going to tell you what I'm seeing after you see whatever you see, OK? So we're just going to have a moment of silence on this video. Um, see yourself in the theatre in a comfortable chair okay there might be other people in the audience or you might be the only person in the theatre on your own put your popcorn down focus okay seriously focus feel the chair see yourself in the theatre see the stage in front of you it feels as though some of you are quite high up in the gods as it's called but you can still see maybe you've got binoculars maybe you're close to the stage you're looking at the stage. There's a spotlight there. There's nobody in the spotlight. You become aware of a presence coming in from the right-hand side. A man uh, in spirit walking from the right-hand side of the stage. And he's now going into the center of the spotlight. And interestingly, as he does so, his image or how he's portraying himself becomes magnified bigger than it would be normally of somebody standing in the centre of that stage. Become aware of what you notice. Are you looking at his... I want to say you're looking at his feet. Are you looking at his feet? Some of you are looking at his feet. Um, scroll up. It's just that I don't know what part you're seeing. It's really interesting. I'm being shown his feet. But equally, his face is there. His body is there. Whatever he is showing you look into that some of you are looking into his eyes some of you are looking at his hair some of you are looking at his clothes more than anything feel into the energy of the being there in the spotlight I definitely feel as though he's taking a bow and then with the eyes that he's got which are very laser like he's looking at you He's looking at you and he's conveying an energy through his eyes. He's giving you a message. He's giving us a message. Okay. So you can take note of what that is. I'm just going to tune into what he's saying through me now for you, which may be the same, it may be different, it really doesn't matter. Mm, okay, he's saying you have all been assembled. This has all been orchestrated. 
we've all been assembled to be in this one theatre at this one time together. And there are people in this theatre that are from the future. There are people here that are from the past. There are ancestors in the boxes, the old fashioned theatres with the music box, the boxes. I'm seeing ancestors in the boxes. There is a grand ensemble, he's saying, grand ensemble of people um, of all races, of all ages, of all sexes, of all persuasions, of all interests. He's called us. He's like the showman. He's called us for a reason. And he's saying the reason will become clear. I'm now being shown an envelope, a paper envelope that's being given to you. Open the envelope. There might be a word on it, a letter on it, a meeting place on it, a book on it, a name on it, a photograph on it, a flower on it. Put the, put the energetic envelope with the message into your pocket and it will become clear, he's saying. I'm being drawn to, and I need to look at what this is. He's got a little brooch that he's wearing on his lapel there. It's like a little diamond star. Um... Let me just look and see if I can see that quickly, what that could be. Hold on. He's telling me to put the laptop down. He's, okay, he's talking about going to the direct source, which is him, of course. <laughs> I believe... I I feel it was something that linked him to his mother for whatever reason. That's what I'm feeling. It linked him to his mother. Um, it feels as though it's something that links him to brotherhood. He's not showing me. It's almost as though, you know, I just said on the envelope, there's a, there's a shape, a symbol, a colour or whatever. That's what he's given me to look into. So, okay, maybe we should leave it on a cliffhanger. I, I really don't know what that is all about, but um, I'm sure all will become clear. So, with the sound of my neighbour ripping down the fence, with me ripping down the fence in terms of let us um, not be scared of communicating with spirit and knowing that this is just as normal as breathing, let us look forward to more time with him, uh, greater questions, uh, the thing about travelling to other lands, I haven't asked him in this video. Um, I will just quickly ask him. So flying through the air, trans being transported, uh, William, to... Is it OK to call you William? He, he says, yes, it is. OK, thank you. Um, Mr Steed, it would have been during the day, uh, during his day, uh, eminent gentleman. But he says, I realise I have to move with the times. William is fine. OK. Um... Yeah, so travelling travelling to different dimensions, travelling to different lands. He says it's it's as simple as going to sleep and uh opening up your eyes to a new day. He says you do it every every night. You 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 go to the land of nod, don't you? <laughs> you go to the land of sleep, you go to the land of dreams, you wake up to a brand new day. Everything has changed. Um the, the the sun has risen again. Uh, it is as simple as that. So he says, we will talk more. He says, it's enough for now. It's enough for now. Yeah, I'm going to leave it there, guys. I'm going to leave it there. Okay, I hope you enjoyed this introduction to him. Um, it, maybe I should just open it on one page and see what I get. Shall I just do that to finish us off? Okay, I'm here on page 73. So let's see. Page 73. What's this about? 73 is, I'm going to read you the first paragraph. Uh, it's about Christ, Christ and spiritualism. 
Uh, it says, unfortunately, the word spiritualism has been associated with so many misconceptions that it affords scope for misinterpretation. And for this reason, thousands of people misunderstand the word and that it's and suppose that it deals only with forms of fortune telling and ch chicanery of all kinds. That's an old fashioned word and must necessarily be wrong and dangerous. Therefore, the work of the Antichrist. For this reason, spiritualism is a barred subject. Not only do these people know nothing about it, but they are so horrified at the travesty that they themselves have created that they would refuse to hear, see or read a word upon the subject. To all people who have knowledge of spiritualism, this attitude is tiresome and regrettable. Nevertheless, it exists today and in great force. Um... Yeah, there's something I read also with him where he's talking about the fact that his work, his words are for, are for the people like us that get it, you know, and how blessed are we to be in the theatre with him. I think that's where I'd like to leave it. We're still in the theatre with him and the show hasn't even yet begun. This was just the menu of what might be coming up. Uh, so stay, stay tuned. There's going to be a lot more to see and hear from him. I do hope that you enjoyed this. If you did, please share the video, like the video, mention it, mention it to other people, because I think that he deserves a, uh, a bigger auditorium. I'd like to see more people in the auditorium uh, because it's one of those things that is a bit like the person who doesn't even realise it's what they need. It's, that's very true of spirituality. So many people who are asleep and don't even realise that there's another world out there. There are other realms out there. There are other dimensions out there that we can connect to spirit both sides of the veil. Ripping down the fence is very symbolic. Maybe I should go and help her, hey? <laughs> Lots of love. Take care. Bye-bye for now. Thank you. Bye.